Uh, we were dealing with absolute value yesterday, the absolute value of a number. We're going to deal with absolute value of functions today. But the absolute value of a number is simply the amount of the number, how far the number is from zero on a number line. And what that really boils down to is that the absolute value of a thing is equal to that thing if the thing was already positive. And that's going to require a bit of thought on your part, but it's going to become more and more important today and on Monday of next week. That when I say, what is the absolute value, for example, in question number 1a of 9, what is the absolute value of 9? It's 9. So what that means is that you don't even need the absolute value signs. If you want to communicate to me what this thing is, these absolute value signs are just not at all necessary, are they? Because the absolute value of 9 is 9. On the other hand, the absolute value of a different thing, if that thing was negative, the absolute value of that thing, which I'm just calling blah, is actually equal to negative 1 multiplied by that thing. And I know that some of you will say to yourselves, We're, man, you're overcomplicating things. I get that. But it's necessary when we get into functions, as I said today and on Monday. So for example, when I say, what is the absolute value of negative 7? The absolute value of negative 7, we know is 7, but that's because negative 1 times the negative 7 will give you the positive 7. And essentially, that bottom statement is simply saying to you, if you're taking the absolute value of something that's negative, you have to multiply it by a negative 1 to turn it into a positive. Take a look over your work, please. Does anybody have any questions from uh, this section's practice problems that you would like me to go over? All right. So we have another lesson to cover today, and then you should probably have some time to work on practice with this lesson, plus to finish off, hopefully, or get started, for some of you maybe, assignment number four, which is due on Monday. This, I believe, is on page 20 of your unit handout. Is that right? OK. Um, and we're graphing what are called linear absolute value functions and quadratic absolute value functions. We're not using our graphing calculator here. In learning this material, the graphing calculator is not going to help you understand it. In order to understand the relationship between a function and the absolute value of the same function, which is the second goal, we have to graph these things on paper. We have to look at the structure of them and how we plot the points. So to begin with, we're starting off with a very simple function f of x. It says f of x equals x. So I can write f of x equals x in a number of different ways. Since f of x is y, I can always say y equals f of x. And don't get too bogged down in all the function notation. All we're saying is that this first function has a formula of y is equal to x. That's all it's saying f of x equals x means y equals x. But I could always write y equals f of x. And when I write y equals f of x, there's hardly any information I'm conveying to you. I'm just saying y is the function. But when I write f of x equals x, or when I write y equals x, I'm telling you the equation of the function. The second function is g of x equals the absolute value of x. So the second function is y equals g of x. 
not f of x because we're using f of x for the first function, so we're using g of x for the second. And since g of x is the absolute value of x, the second function is y equals the absolute value of x. And I know often with function notation, it seems like we're chasing our tail and just going around in circles. As you get to further and further content in this course, and particularly Math 30-1 as well, you'll see the need for function notation. So I'm asking you to make a table of values here, and I've already chosen the x coordinates that we're going to use. x is negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. So on the first function, what is y when x is negative 3? Well, it's negative 3 because y equals x. And, and I want to show something to you right now that, strangely enough, if the function was more complicated, more people understand what we're doing. If I told you to make a table of values, and this is not what we're doing here, but I told you to make a table of values where y was equal to 4x plus 3, and I said x is negative 3, You'd put negative 3 in for x, and you'd take 4 times negative 3, and you would add 3. Are you with me on that? If I said, what about when x is 2? Then you would put 2 in for x. You'd go 4 times 2 plus 3. Well, that's exactly what we're doing with this first column we're filling in, except that the function is so simple, y equals x. We put this number here in for x to get y coming out. That's all. It's just that y is x. There's no work to be done. There's no thought to be done. So th the bottom line here, everybody, is that whatever the x coordinate is on the first function, that will be the y coordinate on the first function. Now, if I said to you, what about the y coordinate on the second function? So if y on the second function is equal to the absolute value of x, then y when x is negative 3 is the absolute value of negative 3, which is 3. When x is negative 2, y on the second function is the absolute value of negative 2. When x is negative 1, it's the absolute value of negative 1, and we continue this process. And I want to explain something that's very subtle. And again, I, the reason why I think it's complicated for me to explain or difficult for me to explain and difficult for you to really wrap your head around is these functions are just too simple. But when we filled in the third column, everybody, we looked at the first column, didn't we? We looked at the first column and we said, what's the absolute value of that? But the bigger point is that the second column is x. The third column is the absolute value of that. So it isn't, although it is the case that it's the absolute value of x, we can think of it as the absolute value of the y-coordinate without the absolute value signs. And I'm just going to leave that there. And we're going to come back to that. And when we get to a more complicated question, it should start to make more sense. What we're asked to do now is plot these functions. So what does y equals x look like? Well, when x is negative 3, y is negative 3. You go ahead and continue plotting those while I grab some rulers and give everybody a ruler because I would like your notes to be fairly civilized in terms of neatness and what you're drawing. We know that y equals x is a linear function, so you're going to have a straight line. And I'm just asking you to use a ruler to draw it.
Now you, you're going to suffer here from the problem that you're going to have an overlap of these two functions. And I know that some of you have already finished, but try not to get too far ahead of me here. You're going to have an overlap, and you're going to have to find a way to communicate that overlap in some way. Incidentally, I'm aware of the fact that you probably don't need to plot all of these points. You get the idea that if y equals x, which is what I'm drawing in red, if y is equal to x, then every place on the graph y equals x, you're going to have a line. In other words, it's going to look like this. And the line, of course, like all lines, not line segments, goes on forever. I hope everybody is fine. I'm drawing mine very thick for a particular reason. You don't need to. I hope everybody is fine with me not having to plot all of the points to get that line. Okay. Now, I want to talk about g of x. So when g of x is negative 3, y is 3. Why is that? And again, I may be overcomplicating things, but we need to at some point understand this idea. The reason is is that without the absolute value signs, the graph has a y-coordinate here that's negative. So if I'm going to say the y-coordinate is the absolute value of that, then that negative has to become positive. In other words, we're back at the idea here that this y-coordinate where the green point is right now is negative. So to get the absolute value of that negative number, you multiply that negative number by negative 1. Boom, it becomes positive. I'm getting at if there's a point below the x-axis, then the absolute value of it will be the point that's the same distance above the x-axis. Similarly, this has a y-coordinate of negative 2. So if I want to take the absolute value of this to get the y-coordinate on the second function, I have to multiply that number by negative 1, and that's going to flip it up above the x-axis. Same with this point. I have to flip it up above the x-axis. Now, by the way, all of these points, there's nothing special about the integer points. That point also needs to be flipped above. Are you with me on that? But this point, which is a point on the red graph, does it need to be flipped? No, because the y-coordinate there is 0. The absolute value is 0. We don't need the absolute value signs, which actually takes me back to something that I want to make a slight correction to when I wrote something up here. And it's, it is an important idea that the absolute value of a thing is equal to a thing if that thing, if that thing was positive or zero. If that thing is zero, then we don't need the absolute value signs. Okay. So we continue with this process. Of course, all of these other points, the absolute value of 1 is 1, the absolute value of 2 is 2. We don't need to reflect anything. So when we sketch the absolute value of x, what it looks like is this. And this is the only reason why I made that red line thicker, is so that you could see there's a part of the original graph, y equals x in red, that's identical to a part of the absolute value of x. And there's a part where they're not the same. Of course, there's arrowheads on the end of this. So the absolute value of x is a v. And just like you need to know that 
y equals x squared is a parabola with its vertex at the origin, you need to become familiar with y equals the absolute value of x. You need to say, oh, well, that's the absolute value of x. That's what it looks like. And the reason is, ah, why not? If I told you to graph y equals x minus 1 squared plus 3, we know you start off with the parabola at the origin and shift it 1 to the right and 3 up. And if you don't know that, you have to know that in this course. Are you with me on that? So if I were asking you to sketch that, it would look like the following. You would take y equals x squared, shift it 3 to the right, no, 1 to the right and 3 up. This would be at 1 comma 3. If I asked you to sketch this, you'd do the exact same thing, except you would start off with y equals the absolute value of x, which would be here, roughly, and you would shift it 1 to the right and 3 up. And we're going to learn next year in Math 30 that it could be any function. It could be any function. When you subtract 1 from x and add 3 to the whole thing, it will move that whole graph, no matter what it looks like, 1 to the right and 3 up. All right, let's do something before we go on and finish this first part of the warm-up. Let's go to our graphing calculator. Graph y equals x. I'm going to just stop here and go y equals x and go zoom standard. There it is. It, it doesn't look like it's at 45 degrees because your calculator screen is not a square screen and it's scaled negative 10 to 10 horizontally, negative 10 to 10 vertically, but the horizontal is a longer distance. Okay. If you wanted to, you could go zoom square. And what zoom square does is it takes your window settings and adjusts it so that if this is one horizontally, that same distance is one vertically. If you go to your window settings, well, let's do this first. Now it looks like it's at 45. If you go to your window settings, you can see that it has to play around with the window settings to make it work. Anyway, I'm also going to plot now the absolute value of x. Absolute value can be found under the math section in the number submenu. X, I'm going to, just so we can make it visible, scroll over to the left of Y2 and hit enter until I see what I've always called the bouncy ball. Because then it shows, as it's drawing it, it shows what it's drawing. Since there's an overlap, if I don't see that ball, it would just hit the origin, and then I wouldn't know if it's matching or not. Anyway, any questions with number two of warm-up A? All right. Um, number three, describe how the graph of g of x is related to the graph of f of x. So now I want to introduce something. Again, we're, we're slowly getting to where we want to be, but I want to say to you that since y equals f of x is the function f of x equals x. And this is, I'm going around in circles. But this is the same function. These two things are identical. And since y equals g of x is g of x equals the absolute value of x, I'm going to write down something else here. And I want you to think about it. If this is all true, then I should have had an absolute value symbol here, not a bracket. Then g of x is the absolute value of f of x. The graph of g of x is the absolute value of the graph of f of x, because f of x is x. And g of x is the absolute value of x. So we can say, since x and f of x are the same, I can say the absolute value of x, or I can just say the absolute value of f of x. And this is the important part here. Look, if f of x is positive, we don't need the absolute value signs. 
Don't forget, this is going to be even trickier, f of x is another way of saying y. So I'm telling you that if the y coordinate on the original function is positive, we don't need the absolute value signs. And I want you to notice when you look at the graph here that the y coordinate on the red graph is positive everywhere here or zero at the origin. So we don't need the absolute value signs, therefore the graph of the absolute value of that function is the same as that function. It's overlapping. Whereas over here, the y coordinate on f of x is negative. So how do you find the absolute value of a negative thing? You multiply that negative thing by a positive thing. So when f of x, and conceptually this is difficult, when f of x, this thing I've underlined on the right, when that's positive or zero, eh, you just ignore the absolute value signs and nothing changes. But when that thing that I've underlined is less than zero, you have to get rid of the absolute value signs and multiply it by negative one. Which means all of these points I've marked with negatives where f of x is negative, the absolute value becomes negative of that, which flips it up. We can answer the question now. And I'm going to keep driving at this idea over and over again. But the question is answered by saying when f of x is greater than or equal to 0, g of x is identical. because g of x is the absolute value of f of x. So if f of x is not negative, then we don't need the absolute value signs. When f of x is negative, g of x is reflected above the x-axis. Um, the reason is, if f of x is negative, the y coordinate is negative, and to make it positive, you have to move it above the x-axis. Any comments or questions about our answer to question three of warm-up A? Okay, we do have a little bit more work to do here. Warm up B, consider two functions. Y equals one half x squared minus x minus four. And Y equals the absolute value of that thing. So we're gonna make a table of values. Rather than me writing in kind of what I wrote in for the last example, I just wanna point out to you that that column will be found by calculating one-half x squared minus x minus four. The third column will be found by calculating the absolute value of one-half x squared minus x minus four. But I want you to note, and this is where it will become, I, I think, easier to follow, that the third column since the third column is the absolute value of one half x squared minus x minus four, and the second column is one half x squared minus x minus four, the third column is the absolute value of the second column. Right? So let's do this. And, you know, I think even though I don't want you to look at the graph right now, I think the quickest, most efficient way to get these numbers is to put this f of x in for y and go to our table because that's what we're filling in, right? A table. So I'm going to put in 1 half x squared and I'm just going to put 0.5 x squared uh, minus x minus 4. 
I'm going to set my table to start at negative 3 and go up by 1. It's pretty easy. Right. 3.5, 0, negative 2.5, negative 4, negative 4.5. Negative 4 again, because it's a parabola. It's coming down, and then it's going back up. Uh, negative 2.5. And then if I scroll down, I can see more entries. I want to go up to 5. That nah, doesn't matter. I want to go up to 5, so the next one is 0, and the next one is 3.5. Now, I, I want to show you something. Well, let's fill out the table first. Since h of x is the absolute value of f of x, and maybe we should write this down. And everybody think about that statement I just wrote in brown. Look at the equation for h of x. Look at the equation for f of x. I'm saying h of x is the absolute value of f of x. Then if I want to enter into my calculator for y2, I don't know if you know that you can do this. If I want to enter for y2 the absolute value of y1, I don't have to say the absolute value of 0.5x squared minus x minus 4. I can go the absolute value of, I can enter y1 here. I go to the vars button. VAR stands for variables, and I scroll over to the Y variables. It's really hidden, and then I choose function, because we're graphing functions. And then I can just choose Y1, and look what it does. It takes the absolute value of Y1. So it's not going to recalculate all that and then take the absolute value. It's just going to look in the second column. Wow. Yeah, the second column, it's just going to get rid of any negatives if there are negatives. Which makes sense, because h of x is the absolute value of f of x. This middle column is f of x. So the absolute value of these numbers will be... Uh, by the way, I hope you're not confused by that. This is not starting at negative 3. It is now. Right, I, I had scrolled down earlier. So this becomes 3.5, 0, 2.5, 4, 4.5, 5, 4, 2.5, 0, 3.5. Any of these numbers that are negative, this is really the only reason we, we learned how to do this with numbers yesterday, becomes positive. Any questions now? Okay. So now we're going to graph it. Um, I'm not sure why on your handout. Well, I just, it's the reason why is I screwed up. I have number two that says use the coordinate pairs to sketch the graphs. And then I have number three and it says use the coordinate pairs to sketch the graphs. We're just, we can do it once. So I actually want to plot these. Negative three comma 3.5, which would be about here. Negative two comma zero negative 1 comma negative 2.5, 1, uh, 0 rather, negative 4, 1, negative 4.5, and then it starts to go up, and, and I hope you see that it's going up in a symmetrical fashion because it's a parabola. What do we get when we get to 4? It's 0. When we get to 5, it's 3.5. Now comes the, the test of your ability to sketch that parabola. Okay, I'm going to do my best here. And I'm going to cheat just ever so slightly. I'm going to clone the right side of this parabola and reflect it horizontally. and then just put it down on the left side. That's not bad. I mean, it's not perfect, right? But you get the idea? Mm. 
Now let's graph the next one without referring directly to the table of values. See, if I were to take f of x here, f of x has a value of 3.5 there. So what's the absolute value of 3.5? 3.5. It doesn't change. If I were to take the point right here and I said, what is f of x? That's the y coordinate on the red function. That's 0. What's the absolute value of 0? Zero? 0. And every place Every place between those two points will also have a y-coordinate which doesn't need the absolute value signs. It's going to stay the same because they're positive or zero. And similarly, this point and this point are not negative f of x's, not negative y's on the red function, so we don't need to do anything to them to find the absolute value, which means that will be identical. But if you take a look at this point here, this point has a y coordinate of negative 4.5. f of x is negative 4.5. Well, what's the absolute value of f of x? Uh, don't forget. h of x equals the absolute value of f of x. And I think that statement, I, I want to go back here to show it to you. I think that statement is very important. f of x is the blue thing. g of x is the green thing. But if you look at the green thing, it's the absolute value of the blue thing. Right. This is the absolute value of that. And that's f of x. So h of x is the absolute value of f of x. And I, I, I really hope some of you are starting to go, yeah, yeah, man, he drones on. I get it. I got it 10 minutes ago because that's the goal. And not everybody will be there yet. I know that. So this point here has an f of x that's negative. We multiply the y coordinate, which is f of x, by negative 1. It becomes positive 4.5. In other words, all of this, and don't draw it just yet because I'm... I'm, what I'm going to draw, I'm not going to leave. This, between this point and this point, and connecting them, this whole thing here needs to be multiplied by negative 1 to get the absolute value of it. And what happens then is that part gets flipped up. And, you know, we, we should have learned something from these first two examples by now, and it's that if you want to take the absolute value of a graph, take anything that's below the x-axis and fold it above. That's it. I realize that maybe that green is a little hard to see. I think that might make it just a little bit more visual. By the way, we already have these two loaded in our graphing calculator, don't we? Or I do. So if I go to y equals, and I'm going to change everybody my y2 to a bouncy ball. Graph, here comes the function, here comes boing the absolute value of the function. And you know, it doesn't matter what it looks like. I'll show you another one. Don't worry about why it looks like what it looks like or what I'm doing. If I graph y equals sine of x, and I have to do a special uh, zoom setting here, zoom trig, here's y equals sine of x. 
It's a wavy function. It goes on forever. Absolute value, ping, ping. It, everything about sine of x is the same, except if it's negative, it's folded up. And you can do this with any function. No matter who, how wild and wacky the function looks, the absolute value will just take the negative parts and fold it up. Uh, and if you have a, a fancier calculator than this, you have different colors. Can you see that, that there are two different graphs when you do it with the colors? You can. It's, it's very obvious. Okay. Uh, which characteristics of the two graphs are similar and which are different? So now that I've explained this again and again and again, I'm going to say that if f of x is greater than or equal to g of x, they're identical. If f of x is less than 0, that means the y. Remember, f means y. It means the y coordinates are negative. Then g of x is the vertical reflection. of f of x. I'm looking at the clock here and I'm realizing that you're not going to have a huge, huge amount of time at the end of this class. So I'm going to move your assignment due date to Tuesday. Okay? Or Wednesday. I don't, you know, that's not important. What's important is what we're learning right now. Any questions with number four? So now I, I have to do some restructuring here in this lesson. Number five is not part of warm-up B. Number five is just a general question. How do you obtain the graph of y equals f of x from the graph of y equals, sorry, how do you obtain the graph of y equals the absolute value of f of x from the graph of y equals f of x? By the way, if this is the original function. Then all we're saying is g of x, the new function, is the absolute value of f of x, the original function. What do you do? You look at the graph of f of x, and if any part of it is below the x-axis, you fold it up. That's all. So you fold. Negative portions, I'm just wording this in a number of different ways. Negative portions of f of x above the x-axis. That's it. And, and this is all warm up. The objective of the lesson was for you to be able to graph linear absolute value functions and quadratic absolute value functions. Okay. Do you know how to graph linear functions? Yes, you did that in grade 10. So how do you graph the absolute value? You look at the graph that you just made and you fold up the negative pieces. You know how to graph quadratic functions. How do you graph the absolute value of a quadratic? Graph the quadratic and then fold whatever's negative up. So consider this absolute value function. y equals the absolute value of 2x minus 3. If I said sketch it, then you have to sketch the function without the absolute value first. And this is grade 10 stuff. This has a slope of 2, which is 2 over 1, and I'll get to in a minute, and a y-intercept of negative 3. Right. Your linear functions are y equals slope times x plus y-intercept. So that function, y equals 2x minus 3, is, which is like f of x, no absolute value signs. That function has a y-intercept of negative 3 and a slope. I'll keep with the same colors. A y-intercept of negative 3 and a slope of 2. 2 over 1 as a slope means you go 1 to the right and 2 up, 1 to the right and 2 up. So we can start populating this grid with a bunch of points, 1 to the right and 2 up, 1 to the right and 2 up, etc. You can take your 
ruler and sketch it. So how do we sketch the graph of y equals the absolute value of 2x minus 3? This. We fold. Oh, this might look like a dash here. I was being a little lazy. We fold negative. That's how my high school math teacher, one of them, used to abbreviate the word negative. We fold negative portions of the graph above the x-axis. So if I were to graph this, this will be a point. This will be a point. This, All of this will be on the absolute value function, but every other point will be reflected. And we're done. It's, it's not, it's, it's really simple. But, I, well, we'll get to something else in a bit. Any questions with those graphs? You could certainly graph it on your calculator, but that's not the point, because I can give you a function in graph form. I could do this, everybody. And I might do this. Whoops on an exam. I don't, you don't know what the equation for f of x is. You can't put it in your calculator. But this would be a good little one-mark written response question. Sketch the absolute value of f of x. And you would say, I'm going to make this thicker. How many of you are pretty confident you could sketch the absolute value of that function? It would be in green, this point would stay the same because it has a y coordinate of 0. Absolute value of 0 is 0. This point would stay the same. This point would stay the same. This point would stay the same. Every point here, here, and here would all stay the same because the y coordinates are positive. So it would look like this. Since all of these y coordinates are negative and all of these are negative, I mean, I have to admit I'm giving you a bit of an artistic challenge here. You have to fold those pieces up. And I, being the teacher, can feel free to cheat by flipping what I drew. I think I flipped it the wrong way. By flipping what I drew vertically that would be the absolute value of that function okay. all right um, what's the domain and range well looking at the graph Look at the red graph. If the red graph is defined everywhere horizontally, and it is, it goes forever to the left and the right, then you will be able to take the absolute value of it everywhere, which means the green graph has to have the same domain as the red graph. And I will tell you that that's true right now for all functions. If I look at this one, and I told you that the red graph started here, then the green graph will start there. If the red graph has a domain of x is greater than negative 10, the green graph will too. So the domain of the absolute value function here is x is any real number. When you look at the graph, y is greater than or equal to 0. Uh, 
Um, now, how do we determine the x and y intercepts? This is really important. If I said to you, algebraically to do this, which I'm going to, you don't have a graph to look at. You don't. But you know an x-intercept is found by letting y equal 0, and a y-intercept is found by letting x equal 0. And by the way, I didn't forget the absolute value signs here. I'm saying let's find the x and y-intercepts of that function before we absolute value it. So if I find the x-intercept here, this is where y equals 0. I solve this little puny equation. I add 3 to both sides. I divide both sides by 2. I get 1.5. Are you with me on that? Now I have a question for you. And this is deep stuff. The concept of absolute value is really simple, but it gets complicated. Did any of these x-intercepts change when I folded up the negative parts? No. That means for y equals f of x and y equals the absolute value of f of x, they have to have the same x-intercepts. They have to. So whatever the x-intercept of 2x minus 3 is, is the x-intercept of the absolute value of it. So 3 over 2 comma 0. What about the y-intercept? Well, if we find the y-intercept here, we let x equal 0, and we get the y-intercept of negative 3. That's the y-intercept of the original function before we absolute valued it, as if that's a verb, which it isn't. But when we absolute value the original function, things change. Does this y-intercept stay the same when we absolute value everything? No, it becomes positive 3. So the lesson to be learned here is, if the y-intercept of f of x is negative, then the y-intercept of the absolute value will just be the positive value of that. If the y-intercept of f of x was positive, then that will be the y-intercept of the absolute value. And you have to keep going back. I think this is helpful. I hope it is. You have to go back in your head to the idea that if it's below the x-axis, fold it up. If it's on the x-axis, leave it alone. If it's above the x-axis, leave it alone. All right, um, number two. This is the last example. So sketch, okay, now I'm going to cut to the chase. If I said to you, sketch this, the first thing you do is sketch this anyway because you have to see what gets folded up and what doesn't get folded up. So we know that the vertex of this function is at negative 2 comma 4. We also know it opens down because a is negative 1. And we're going to have to reach back into unit 3 and unit 4 to find out some intercepts here. We want a better picture of the graph. Well, look, we don't want to do this. We're, we're better than this. Let's get some x-intercepts and a y-intercept on there and see what it really looks like. And since we are going to be asked to find the x-intercepts of the absolute value function, why don't we start working on the x-intercepts of this function? y equals negative x plus 2 squared plus 4. Did I write it down correctly? Okay. So if I want to find a y-intercept, I let x equal 0, and I figure out what this is. So this is my y-intercept. So I'll give you a minute to run that through your brain or calculator.
I believe it's zero. Because zero plus two is two, two squared is four, negative one times four is negative four, plus the four gives you zero. Oh, this is nice. What does that mean? It means it goes through the origin. There's a y-intercept of zero. And you know what we could actually do right now? Is use the idea that we know parabolas are symmetrical, which means that the axis of symmetry of this, you don't always have to do things algebraically. The axis of symmetry of this parabola is there, which means the other x-intercept has to be just as far away from the axis of symmetry as the first x-intercept. So you know what? We don't need to go any further to find the x-intercepts. This is a fairly accurate picture of that parabola. Perfect? Of course not. But unless we are, you know, starting up a nuclear reactor or landing human beings on Mars, that's good enough for the work we're doing here, right? So what does the graph of the absolute value look like? This should be child's play now. It looks like this. That middle hump, including the x-intercepts, was already, well, let me put it this way, all of those points on the hump and on the x-axis were not in need of an absolute value to make them positive. They were already positive or zero. Everything below gets flipped up. Whoops. Uh, domain and range. X is any real number. You can see that by looking at the graph, and Y is greater than or equal to zero. And we've already found the intercepts. The X intercepts are negative four and zero. The Y intercept is zero. Before I get you started on your practice, I do have a question for you. And it's because it requires a bit more thought, but you might see this on an exam. Is it always going to be this range? When you fold the negative parts of a graph up above the x-axis, are you always going to have a range of y is greater than or equal to 0? No. What if, and let's stick with the parabola. What if I had a parabola, well, okay. If your parabola looks like this, then the new function I hope you see will look like this. I'm not going to try to draw it perfectly, but you understand that will be the new function. Y will be greater than or equal to zero. What if the original graph looks like this. That's y equals f of x. What will y equal the absolute value of f of x look like? miles? It looked like that. And that does not have a range of y is greater than or equal to zero. That has a range of y is greater than or equal to whatever that point is. So this, if this is the function, since everything, since everything is already positive, greater than or equal to zero, we leave it alone. Um, is there a situation, so nothing changed, right? 
nothing changed. In every other example we looked at, some stuff changed and some didn't, including this beast or this one. Some of this changes and some of this doesn't. You with me on that? Some of this changed and some didn't. Some of this changed and some didn't. None of this changed. Is it possible that everything changes? Yeah. If the entire thing is below the x-axis, then everything will change. So for example, if I take a look at, don't worry about why this works, I'm going to graph y equals sine of x minus 2. And it's going to draw it first, and you will see that it is all below the x-axis. Whoops, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, I meant to put minus 2, not times negative 2. So this is sine of x minus 2, all below the x-axis. Mirror image above the x-axis. So be very, I, I just want to draw this to a conclusion by saying be very careful about coming up with conclusions that won't always be true. Oh, y is always greater than or equal to zero. Not necessarily. You do see that these two are reflections across the x-axis, right? Okay, it's harder, it's easier to see reflections horizontally than it is vertically. So, uh, really a thinking person's lesson. It's not just about procedure here, it's about thinking. You have about 15 minutes, 20 minutes or so to practice these problems. I am still going to, that's a fair amount of practice time, but I'm still going to say that your uh, assignment number four is due Tuesday now. The lesson we do Monday is pretty deep, maybe deeper in some ways than this. So don't leave that assignment until, don't leave it too late, okay? Uh, I have a couple of things to do at my computer attendance and clip this video and then I'll be around to help you out.